Well, welcome everyone uh, to our A to J Author New User Webinar. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Author's Project Manager. Today we're going to talk about a primer for document assembly. So this is a true new user webinar in that it is meant for everyone who's anyone who's just getting started in document assembly. On today's agenda, we're going to talk about how to get started with your project um, and big picture how document assembly works. And we'll talk about the scope of your project, basic question design, how to begin automation, and how to add a template. So let's talk first about getting started. For this first section, I want to make sure you understand the terminology that I'll be using and the basics of document assembly at a high level. So for a basic A to J author document assembly project, you have an A to J guided interview and a template. The interview is the portion that the end user sees and interacts with. The template is the back end piece that overlays the user's answers with the form. Within A to J Author, you can have an A to J guided interview, so the front end piece, partnered with several back end tools. Most commonly, the template is created in Hotdocs or A to J Author's own document assembly tool called the A to J DAT. However, it's possible to connect your A to J guided interview with your case management system, your court's e filing system another document assembly backend template building tool, or to just have an informational only interview that doesn't produce any document. Here on the screen, you have the underlying form to be automated and you need to ask the user questions to fill in those blanks on the form. Those blanks are represented by variables that you'll use in your interview to store the end user's answers. The end user answers the interview questions by filling in the blanks. Those answers are stored in the variables. Those variables are stored in the answer file. And the answer file format is .amx, so it's an XML file format. When the user clicks Get My Document or Submit, their answer file with those variables and the associated values input by the user are passed to the server. The server compiles those answers with the template and returns a completed document to the end user. So let's talk now about narrowing the scope. So this is one of the keys to a successful and on-time document assembly project. Often the goals of a project aren't clearly defined and you can start to automate an interview and run into an issue of, well, wouldn't it be great if one other form was added so that this X group of people could be included? And then you're going further into it and you're like, well, if I just add these two other forms, then these other people can be helped. And soon you've got a really unwieldy project that's hard to finish, hard to test, and hard to maintain. You also want to make sure that you have all the forms that your end user actually needs to complete the desired action. So if they're trying to complete their, you know, their, start their divorce, they're actually going to need a cover sheet. They're going to need information like the sample judgment. They're going to need to know how to serve the other party. Um, so you want to make sure your package is sort of the Goldilocks of projects. So it's not too big in that it's super unwieldy and can't be dealt with after you complete it. And that it's not too small so that the end user is going to still need to do something else after they complete your complete the um, document assembly package that you've done. So you want that middle ground where not too big, but not too small. So the first thing to do is to define the scope. So you need to decide on what form you want to automate and what the goal of your project is. So for example, you want to automate the forms needed to start a divorce in A to Z author state. So then you decide exactly who your form is going to help. So not every form is for every person. Not every person in that situation should or can use self-help resources. So you can narrow the, the scope of who you're going to help by thinking about, so for example, um, my form is only going to help people who have less than five children with the same biological parents that live in this specific jurisdiction and they can't have jointly owned property over 25,000. That might be an uncontested divorce um, with only five children or maybe no children and under $25,000 in shared assets. So your project might not help everybody who needs a divorce in your jurisdiction, but your project can help a specific subset of those people and you just have to figure out where you're gonna draw the line in terms of resources and time that you want to put into automating this and thinking about the time it's going to take to keep this up over the years as, as forms change and the law changes. So you don't have to help everyone. You just have to think about who specifically you want to help. This, this person that you're thinking of that you're helping is your user persona. So it's a theoretical person who's going to use your document assembly package. 
um, and you should probably try to create one to five user personas for your project depending on its complexity. So throughout the entire authoring process, you're going to want to keep these user personas in mind, these people. What information would this person need? What access to data or internet connection are they likely going to have? How much time will they have to complete the form? Will they need the ability to save and come back? Will they have access to the paperwork that they need to complete the form? Do you need to define legal terms for them? All of that is what you're thinking about as you're writing the questions and starting to automate the form, that user persona. The third step then is to gather all the forms that your end user will need to complete the goal. So for example, are they going to need that cover sheet? Are they gonna need a notice of service, a sample judgment form? Make sure to include everything the end user will need to complete the process. So you don't need every form for the entire legal process, just the forms necessary for the goal. So if you remember the goal was, for example, starting a divorce with less than five kids and personal property under 25,000 in the state of A to J office. So I wanna make sure they have all the forms for starting the divorce. I don't necessarily need all the forms for the entire divorce process. Then you want to define the variables. So once you know what forms you're going to need, and I, when I do automation, I like to have the physical copy of the form or a digital copy like this here so that I can go through and highlight all of the blanks. So where is all of the information that I'm going to need to get out of this end user? So um, highlighting, for example, on this figure one here, all of the spaces that uh, are gonna have to contain variables. So then I can start defining my variables. So I can use a naming convention. Um, we recommend coming up with a naming convention for your organization's variables. The naming convention that we currently use is one like plaintiff name full TE, plaintiff name first TE. So the plaintiff describes who it is, the name, and then the full name is a, the more, um, the, the fuller adjective goes after it. And then TE stands for text variable. So I know looking at it that that's a text variable later on. The naming convention is in Appendix C of our A to J author authoring guide, which you can find under the Learn tab on our website, a to j author.org. So if you're interested in the naming convention that's generally followed in the legal aid document automation community, you can check that out. But whatever naming convention you use, make sure that you're consistent. So this is going to help you and others in your organization or future you or future whoever is doing the development debug any issues during testing. And it's going to be easier for anyone who has to update that guided interview in the future. So if you're starting a document assembly project for the first time in your organization, it would be really good to develop a, a variable naming convention policy for all of your automated forms going forward. So this is some of the benefit of um, having A to J author around for 16 years now. We, we've seen it sort of go around the block and uh, having a, a strict naming convention that you follow when you're creating automated forms is one of those uh, pro tips that's helpful. And then finally, you want to look for any areas that could potentially need to be repeated or addendums that will have to be added later. So for example, does the form ask about the user's children? That's a perfect uh, place for a repeat loop. Um, a repeat loop is a, a series of questions that gathers the same type of information over and over again based on how many times the user needs it. So this form, for example, has the child's first name and last initial and their year of birth. So for each of their children, you're going to have to gather the same information. Instead of making you know, 15 questions potentially, you can have one set of three questions that can be repeated up to five times because your user, uh, your scope is limiting it to five children. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about basic question design. So a storyboard is an important part of the process of creating a pro se friendly A to J guided interview. The storyboard helps you to prepare for authoring the interview in the software by organizing your questions, your steps, the variables you'll need to associate with each question. It also helps you review your interview questions for plain language before moving, moving on to the actual authoring process. And a storyboard can also be a script or referred to as a process map. There's a variety of ways that you can do it. You want to find the way that works best for you. So one of the, one of the tips for starting is to make a list of all the questions that you're going to need to ask the end user. So think of every question that, that will need to be asked to fill out the variable list that you already created in that scoping process. Look at that list of questions. Do any of the areas or topics overlap? 
if so, group those questions together. So for example, if the form asks for the user's children's name on page one, but their address on page four, and something else about the children on page five, you can group all of that similar information into one step about the children. The form doesn't have to dictate the flow of the questions of your interview. Your questions can be grouped together and asked in any order, and then they can be placed onto the appropriate area of the form that the court dictates. Then you wanna start forming blocks of questions from your groups. So for example, um, you have spouse's name, spouse's information, you have children's information, you have your information, and then you wanna start combining that variable list with the question list. So for here, for example, at the top under 1A, what is your name? And I want to ask for their first, middle, and last name. For their address, I want to make sure I get street, city, and state. So that's combining the list of variables denoted by um, the variable names in brackets with the questions that I'm going to ask to gather that information. You can also start building in conditional branching. So for 1C, you can see, um, are you married? I want to store the answer to that question in married TF, a true-false variable. And if true, I'm going to branch them to 2A, the spouse's name. If false, so they're not married, I'm going to branch them onto the children question because the spouse information isn't relevant to these people. Um, so the storyboard can come in, uh, in a variety of ways. So I prefer the outline format, but there's also the option of a flow chart. Um, and we'll, I'll show you uh, in a little bit about how our map can be used to build this flow chart if, if you prefer the visual representation. So whatever it is, just find the one that works best for you and start getting the flow of your interview um, blocked out before you start authoring. Another important part of the drafting process is making sure that your interview is in plain language. So we recommend shooting for a fifth grade reading level, generally for your interview text. And you can see the grade level of your interview by running a full report or a text report under the report tab in each interview. It'll break down each section of the text and give you the Flush Kincaid and the Cole Lauman score for that text. So if you're interested in learning more about plain language in the document assembly space, you can check out this video on our YouTube channel at the link here, or by searching just plain language on our YouTube channel. It's an older video, but it's well loved. It has almost 5,000 views on it uh, since it was created. So now you have all of the forms, that you need and you've drafted or outlined your question, it's time to start authoring and start automating, but how? So the first step uh, is to go to our website, uh, adajauthor.org, and to log in, you go to the author tab. Everything else on our website is completely open. You can check out all of our training materials, anything about the law school courses we've taught, any news that we have, all of it's completely open. The only part that is restricted is the author tab. We require you to just create an account and fill out a little short form about who's using it so that we can get that information um, and use it for grant purposes to show who's using A to J author. So everything else is wide open. And then once you are logged in, you will see the run A to J author button. If you don't see this run A to J author button under the author tab, you either need to log in or your account has not been authenticated yet. And if you're having, there's explanation about how to create an account on the website. But if you run in, into any issues, always feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org. And if you don't see the run button, you'll see this instead where it says uh, user login at the bottom and you can log in. You can either have an account or create a new one. And then once you, are, you click that and you get into the software, you're going to land on the interviews tab. And you'll want to familiarize yourself with the software. Everything in A to J Author is organized by tabs. So when you first enter the software, you start on the interviews tab. From there, you either start a new interview or you open up one that you've worked on before. Then you can move through the other tabs of the interview. The authoring guide, which can be found under that learn tab on a to jauthor.org, has detailed descriptions of what each section does. But just for a quick overview, let's pop into A to J author itself. So here I am on the interviews tab. I can open up a blank interview, or I could have opened up um, any of the ones that I've already worked on in the past. So for this blank interview, we'll just go quickly through the tabs. There's more detailed instruction uh, explanations about those in other videos on our YouTube channel, plus the authoring guide. But 
the About tab gives you the metadata of your interview. So you pick the gender, skin tone, and hair color of your guide avatar. So by changing the hair color, skin tone, you can um, change the representation of your avatar. You can change the language of your interview. A to J currently supports 16 different languages. So we have translated about 35 phrases that are common to all interviews, like exit, next, yes, no, back, continue, that kind of thing. The text of your interview is whatever you type it in. So you, there's no automatic translation of your text from, uh, you know, if you type it in English, it's not going to pop out in Spanish or um, Arabic or whatever. You need to do that yourself. Um, but the chrome of the interview, the, those things that are common to all interviews are translated here. Um, this also has areas for you to add information about who's creating the interview, any revision notes. You want to allow feedback and changing the layout. So if you want a different, uh, if you want to add your logo to the bottom right hand corner of the interview or change the background image instead of it being a courthouse at the end of the process, you can have whatever you any picture you'd like. Again, all this is explained in more detail in the authoring guide. The variables is next. This tab allows you to add interviews or pull in hot docs variables if you're using hot docs. By clicking on any of the variables, you get a more detailed description of what that variable is. You can make changes to it. The steps tab lets you uh, set up sort of the, the broader categories or groups of your, inf of your information. So in that outline example, there was Children's information, spouse's information, your information, all of those are separate steps. And you can add, um, um, you can have a maximum of 13 steps. So you can add those here. Pages tab we'll come back to because we're going to spend a lot of time working in that when you're authoring. The map I'll come back to as well because I'll talk about it um, after the pages tab. But all files shows you all the files that are in your interview. All logic shows you all the logic in your interview. This one doesn't have any logic because it's a brand new interview, but if there was logic, I would be able to edit all of the conditional statements right here. Same for all text. It shows you all of the text in the interview, and each section is editable um, immediately. Scroll a little bit. Preview mode takes you into what the interview would look like as an end user so that you can see exactly how your questions are spaced um, and how they look when you add different fields to them. You can walk through your entire interview like this. Leaving preview mode, the reports tab gives you a full report um, by default of your entire interview. So everything in your interview, steps, variables, all the about information, all the, all the pop-ups, and it shows you the grade level. Publish lets you get your interview out of a to J author and into wherever you want to publish it. Most commonly, if you're in legal aid and LSC funded, you're going to publish it to LHI's production site. LHI is Law Help Interactive. They're a organization uh, or a part of Pro Bono Net, um, which gets LSC funding to be the national server for A to J author and hot dogs. Their uh, Rebuild QA is their staging site. So when they're testing out new versions of our viewer or anything in their code, you can publish it to there to test. You can publish it to a to j.org, which is Cali's uh, hosting site. Cali is a to j author's parent organization. And we provide free hosting to um, anyone who is creating forms for self represented litigants. You can publish to a to j.org and have your end users run the interviews from there. You can also download the zip file or just the a to j file. Um, if you're sharing with anyone or you ever have problems and, you, and I ask you to send me your uh, zip file, this is the button you're going to want. It has everything in your interview, including all files associated with it, all templates, um, and the A to J file itself. A to J.org shows you all of the interviews that you've published. So these are all the ones that I have um, that I'm hosting on our site, either in demo or live mode. Templates, we'll talk about in a little bit. It's where you actually go and create the templates. And then analytics is a cool feature that we added last uh, end of last summer that lets you see the specific analytics for your interview. Um, and all you have to do to enable analytics is click to request them. And then um, Tobias, who's our A to J author backend developer, will set up the, um, the backend sorting and filtering 
of all of the analytics data so that it comes just specifically for yours and you'll be able to see all of the information about how your interview is being run in the wild. So it's a pretty cool feature to check out. And you can request this for new interviews or any existing interviews that you have out there too. If you want specifics about your interview, come and set it up here on the analytics tab. So let's talk more then uh, about the uh, pages tab. So the pages tab and the question design editor are where you're gonna spend the majority of your time when you're creating a guided interview. On this tab, you're gonna create your questions, write the text, add learn more some pop-ups, and create conditional branching with logic statements. And all of this happens in the question design editor. So this is the question design editor. You're gonna be very familiar with it by the time you're done in your A to J guided interview. This is where you do all of the building of the questions themselves. For the question design editor, it's all about the scroll. So all of the work of authoring happens in this one screen. And to access all the features, you just continue scrolling down. So I'm going to show you a series of screenshots of those just further scroll down each time. Starting at the top, we have the step number associated to this page. This is where you can move a page from one step to another. This is also where you name the page. There is a note section that's for author's eyes only. It's not going to be seen by the end user, but it will be included in the citation report and the full report. Um, and anyone who has the author version of your interview will be able to see it. These notes are good for adding reasons about why you asked this question or what the question is based on. So, for example, if the question is, do you make more than twenty five thousand dollars? You might want to leave a note, either a citation under the question itself or and in the note field, explaining why you used $25,000. What is significant about $25,000? So that future you in five years when you're coming to uh, completely redo this or the next developer down the line who has to work on it will know specifically why that $25,000 is there and make sure that it's still legally relevant. Under that is the question text section. This is where you type the text of your question. Then there's the citation field and audio that can be added. Um, this is less helpful sort of now because A to J author went, underwent an accessibility audit in 2018 and we finished WCAG, so Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. We're compliant up to uh, the AAA level, which is as high as you can get with the viewer. So those who users who are accessing your interview using a screen reader can now more easily use a guided interview um, with, a, with, with whatever preferred reader they use rather than authors needing to add audio clips manually. Under that is the learn more information field. So this is the, the prompt is the question that the end user avatar thinks that, that prompts the response from the guide avatar. So learn mores are a just-in-time learning feature that allows you to give your end user additional information at the point in which they need it. In a learn more, it's displayed in a question answer format. The end user avatar thinks the prompt. The user then clicks learn more to see the response or to get the help that you're providing. The help can be text, it can be audio, it can be graphic, it can be a video. By default, the help is text, but is generally text, but you can add any any combination of those graphic, graphic video or audio that you'd like. And then if we move further down, we have the media label. So if you're adding in um, a label about any media you add for screen readers, you're going to want to add that into the media label field. There's also a graphic alt text. So this is about a hundred character or less description for ARIA readers. Um, and we give a little hint to show you where 100 characters actually ends so that you can give a description. When you, if you add a video, we highly recommend adding in a video transcript so that anyone using a screen reader or needing that transcript can have access to it. Before we scroll any further down, here are the text editing options for your question text. So you can embolden, italicize, or underline. You can add a block quote, you can indent, you can outdent, you can add bullets, you can add numbered lists hyperlinks, you can unlink those hyperlinks if you need to, and you can associate a pop-up with a word or phrase in your question text. So pop-ups are, are another just-in-time learning feature that provide definitions of legal terms or other difficult words to your end user at the point in which they're reading them in the text. If we keep scrolling, we get to the fields section. Fields are ways to collect information from your end user. 
You can have up to nine fields per question, and each one can be a different field type, or they can be the same. We'll talk about the field types in just a second. And this just shows you the different types you can select, the labels, variables that are going to be associated behind this. You can change the number of fields, and you can make the field either required, that the user has to answer it before they can move on, or not required. You can learn more about the fields in the authoring guide as well under chapter seven. Here's some additional information about fields. So each field type has different limitations that you can impose on the end user's answers. So for example, character limits for text fields, date ranges can be limited to minimums and maximums. You can include internal or external lists. So if you have an external XML list of, for example, US states, um, which is a list of all of the states, or you can create an internal list where you manually enter the different options for the user to pick from. This us underscore states.xml is a file that we created that's available to all authors under the learn tab. If you hover over it, there's a, let me just show you real quick. You hover over the learn tab, there's new author resources. And this is something that I've collated, um, put together for you guys that includes sort of videos that you're going to want to watch, exercises to practice, the authoring guide, how to get started, and that list of U.S. states is available for you. So you don't have to type out um, all of the states in alphabetical order. We've done it for you. And we include the two letter uh, postal codes as well. So there are 14 field types that help authors format how the field looks to the end user. And also, like I said, uh, allows you to impose limitations on the user's answer. If we keep scrolling, we get to the button section. Buttons are how you move an end user from one question to the next. The button has a label, so that's what the user sees on that button. The button can also have a variable underneath it, but doesn't have to. And you can have the user's click of that button assign a value to that variable. The destination is the next question the user goes to if they click this button. You can have up to three buttons per page. Every page has to have at least one button, the continue button. You can label them however you like. You can also use buttons instead of fields when you have questions that are only uh, three options or less. So, for example, over here on the right, are you the petitioner or the respondent? And they can pick which one they are. You don't have to have them use a checkbox or a radio button or write in. You can just have them click a button instead. Destinations for um, picking where they go next for the, the button can be any other question you've made. And then there's also special exiting options, like the end user wants to be able to save their answer. There's an exiting option for that. Back to per prior question, there's a bunch of different A to J special pages, all described in the authoring guide as well. And then finally, we have in the question design editor, we have the advanced logic section. Just as a brief overview of this, we're going to talk about how um, you script if else statements. But if you have um, any questions about the advanced logic or you want to learn specifically more about that, there is a training video on our YouTube channel. And again, the authoring guide has a lot more details of, with examples of how if you want to do this, here's the logic you need to do to use to script that. But basically, you script if else statements either before the end user presses the button. So you want to test some condition before they see the question or after the end user makes some selection, and then you want to evaluate their answer against some condition. There's only five commands that you need to know when you're scripting logic in A to J author. We created our advanced logic area to be um, as simple as possible for those who are not programmers, but also as complex as needed. So hopefully we're in the, in the middle there. It's not an open, you're not just scripting and writing your interview completely in code but you're also um, given some help if you've never coded before. So it doesn't allow you to do everything, but it, it's very powerful with these five commands. So if, else, go to set and end if. All if statements have to have an end if, and each of these logic statements has to be on its own line. So the hard return if, whatever the condition, hard return else, whatever the condition, hard return end if. Um, and just like every sentence needs a capital letter and punctuation, Every if statement needs an if and an end if to capture that. And remember, not all interviews need logic. So you can have a complete interview that uses just fields and branching um, and doesn't have any advanced logic, and it can be a pretty complex and robust interview for your end users.
So I mentioned we talked about the map again, and one of the great things about A to J Author is that we try to allow authors to create interviews in a variety of ways. Give authors a lot of freedom to create powerful guided interviews, but hopefully in a way that's accessible to those who aren't programmers. So for those that prefer a visual representation of their interview, we have the map, and we did a lot of work in the map last summer to let you create your interview, basically starting from the map. Here, I can quickly um, add questions, so I can add pages, and it adds, there if I add more pages, and I can quickly start building that outline, that process map of my interview. I can move things around. If I, wanna, if I know I'm gonna connect button to, so this one over here, I can draw that connection. I can break the connection if I need to. I can move the page around. I can double click on the page and up pops that question design editor. Um, I can move it around however I like. I can open up the question design editor from here. I can also open up the question design editor from the, the list. So I can change the name of the page. Um, and it's fairly easy to basically knock out an interview while it, in this map format. So you don't, if you prefer the process map, that you can draw your interview out here. Okay, so the, the next thing that we're gonna talk about um, is adding a template. So the workflow historically for document assembly projects has been, um, if you're using like Hotbox or another outside so, uh, backend tool, you're gonna make the template, then you're gonna make your A to J guide interview. But not all interviews have templates or in the past you've been in another software tool, so that's why I focused the beginning of this training on the interview first. But when you're working on your actual project, you're likely going to want to start with a template, automate that, and then automate the questions. And we'll talk now about how you go about adding a template to your interview. So there is a special tab because everything in A to J is a tab. There's a special tab for the templates themselves. So you're going to first go to that templates tab, and then you're going to click to create either a text, PDF, a text template or a PDF template. Both have the same uh, end result for your end user. The output is a PDF either way. The difference is in how you start building the template. So text templates start as blank documents and you add elements to them to build the automated form. So think you're starting with like a blank Google Doc and you're building it out with text, logic, variables, and other elements. It's not a Google Doc, but the idea is that there is a blank open space and you add elements to it. There are template options that control the entire document, like font, headers, footers, conditional logic. Um, the conditional logic is whether or not the entire template is inserted into the final package based on some condition. For example, if the end user says that they have children, you need to insert the custody-related forms in their final package. If they don't have kids, then those forms aren't necessary. You could insert variables right into the text body that you're drafting in a rich text element. So that's what I'm showing you right here. You click the variable icon within the rich text editor and the, at the point at which you wanna insert that variable, like dear, you can see landlord, full name, TE. I live at property, full name. So that's I live at whatever the address is. When you click the variable icon, it's a V. Um, in this rich text editor, it's, it's right behind the screenshot. The picker is gonna start uh, sorting the list of variables based on the characters you type in. So as I start typing in L-A-N-D, the list of variables with the land lord will pop up and I can select the one I want to insert right here. If else conditionals are another element that allow you to conditionally insert other elements. So based on some condition being true or false or some value of a variable being met by the end user's answers, a chunk of text or a repeat loop can be inserted in the final document. Repeat loops are the final major element in a text template. We talked about those before, but they're used when you need to gather the same information from an end user multiple times. So for example, how many children do you have? The, all of the information for those children, or what assets does someone have, or what debts does the user have? That's gathered in a repeat loop as many times as the end user needs it. it can then be displayed back to you, back to the user in the form as many times as they need. So repeat loops in the DAT text templates can be in a table format, a list, or a chunk of text. It's just showing the different types. Part of good authoring practices is to test your interview many times at several different breaking points. So one of those is when creating the interview. So you wanna make sure that the question flows as expected and you haven't left anything out. 
Another is when you've finished automating a section of the template and you want to ensure that it completes the underlying form as expected. Um, you're going to want to test, test, test multiple times. You can do this testing by what we call test assemble. There's a test assemble button within the template itself that opens up a uh, your file management system so you can uh, look for any of those .anx files that you've previously saved. You can create these .anx files in preview mode. So if I'm in my interview, I go to preview mode, I open up this debug panel over here, the button, bottom button on the left. This shows me what's happening behind the scenes in my interview. As I walk through my interview, it's going to save the name of the, the variable and the value that I've input into it. And then if I want to use this for testing later on, I click save, it downloads a local copy, and then I can use that later when I'm test assembling. You're going to want to create a couple of different test answer files to ensure that your interview is thoroughly tested. So for example, if your interview is has a splitting point where someone has kids or doesn't and something else happens, you're going to want to have an interview file that tests with kids and without kids. Or if you have uh, if someone if there's a restriction on um, using the form if they hit an income amount, you're going to want to have that as a, a test and one that exceeds it and one that is under it. You whatever you the boundaries of your interview are, you're going to want to make sure that you have test answer files that push those boundaries to make sure that the points in which you expected to stop someone are met and the points in which someone should be able to go on are met as well. I also recommend testing like crazy scenarios. So I have five kids with five different fathers with five different addresses that they live at. You know, I have a hundred assets, but I have these 15 debts. Like you, you want one that's sort of a crazy outlier test answer file as well. And the great thing about following naming conventions, like we talked about when you were scoping the project, is that you can reuse these answer files with, that you've sort of worked on and created sort of a crazy user persona in different interviews. So I have uh, one for testing purposes that has just, just the first name. And I use that to always make sure that, you know, A to J is working as a, as a smoke test to just make sure that whatever new improvements I can get a document out of. So I have a catalog of saved answer files that I can reuse in any interview because I know that my I followed my variable naming convention and that they're going to match in whatever inter interview I use. The other way to automate within the A to J DAT, the document assembly tool, is creating a PDF template. So this lets you start with an existing PDF document and automate on top of it. This is mostly used when there's complicated or strict formatting that the resulting form must stick to. So if there's a specific way that your court has that their caption has to look and it's really hard to replicate in the text template, just upload the PDF version of it and uh, automate on top of it. One note, always make sure when you're using PDFs to make sure you have a flattened PDF. You don't want any fillable fields, some court forms when you download them from the course website are fillable. You want to make sure that you flatten all the PDF and there's free tools online to do that as well. So you click the upload button, you look for the PDF that you want and then it uploads it and I can start uh, double click on any of these lines and a field will pop up and then I can add a variable to it. The PDF DAT supports multiple page documents. So you don't, you aren't restricted to just one page. You can have as many pages as you need or as your court form requires. Finally, we'll talk um, about how to use what we've learned today. I appreciate everyone sticking around for this sort of longer new user webinar, but it's a lot to digest. So how can you use what you've um, learned? And I created sample exercises as a training tool for new authors. If you have a project in mind, by all means, start with that project. But if you don't have an immediate project or you want to try something easy, something you can do in the next half an hour or so, um, we have sample exercises for you to get started. So there's dozens of sample exercises that range in complexity from like a quick and easy automation one that takes you about 30 minutes to a more comprehensive one that would likely take you several hours to complete. So you can find them all by hovering over the learn tab on A to J author and selecting sample exercises to learn A to J author, that option. All of them have step-by-step -step instructions with screenshots for each point in which I thought um, they would be confusing if you didn't have it. It has the document you start with, as you can see here. You just have to download it and save it as a PDF. 
and then just follow the steps uh, to complete the interview. If you have any questions while you're authoring, I'm always available, jessica at tally.org. You can follow us on Twitter at A to J Author for any news about Document Assembly, about upcoming code pushes, about new features in A to J, new training opportunities. And our YouTube video, as I said, has many videos on it for doing specific things in A to J Author. So thank you all for attending. If there aren't any questions, then I will um, see you all in April. Happy March.